private label lobby. Oh, Legal yeah. Promise. Welcome to episode 102 of the Permaculture Pimp Cast, where pimp stands for permaculture is my passion. The only pimp cast on planet Earth where we discuss permaculture, preparedness, and practical living. Now, ordinarily, I would say, how you doing, son? But I'm flying solo today because I got a different co-host. We'll get to that in a moment. This episode brought to you by Hickory Ridge Soap from Two Old Crows Homestead.com. Turn that simp into a pimp. Bam! Also, every other thing that you could possibly think of, whether it's Harvest Right freeze dryers, we got it. If it's EMP Shield, remember, you get 50 bucks off with promo code PERMA, P E R M A. And of course, those seeds, those Heaven's Harvin seeds. You got to get some of those, y'all, batting a thousand on those. 100% germination right now, but they only claim 85. I'm going to handle all the ads up front because I don't want to fool around. I want to get straight into what we're going to discuss. Now, let me give you a little background on this. Uh, one of my good friends on this planet is a guy named Darren. He's at Hacks for the Homestead. We've been friends for a long, long time, doing incredible things on his own homestead. And he's honestly one of those people, one of those very few people that you could basically take the parts of a 747, drop them off, put them in front of him, and in about an hour, he could turn that thing into a X-31. You name it. The guy is that kind of squared away. So when he writes to me and says, hey, man, I got somebody I met. I know you're going to dig them, and you have got to do this. Darren doesn't do that every – he doesn't do that often. Every blue moon, he does. So when he got my attention doing that, I initially went to this first guest website and it wasn't 10 minutes on. I don't even think it was five minutes. I'm like, okay, she's got a phone number here. I'm going to call her up and uh, didn't send an email, didn't do anything. I'm like, okay, I have got to get her on the show. Next thing you know, we're talking for what seemed like maybe an hour and realize there's a whole lot of overlap, a whole lot we have in common in so many different ways from how we came up in this world to the place in this world where we came from. So without further ado, y'all, my guest today, and you're going to be glad you tuned in, is someone named Tiffany. How are you doing, Tiffany? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Can you get a little closer to the mic? I think we're... Is that better? Even possible. Yeah, I think we're good. I think, you know what? They'll pick... You're going to do most of the talking here today, so... um They'll work the volume up on that, so I wouldn't worry about that. If it's not comfortable holding your 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 camera or whatever it is you're doing there, just you can go back to the way it was. They will adjust the volume because I'm going to leave most of this ball in your court for the most part. Now, y'all, I as you know, if you've been a fan of this show or anything we're doing for any period of time, you know that I am a butcher, have been one for a long time. And one of the hardest things to find, in fact, harder to find than the bones of Bin Laden, is a female butcher. Just so happens when I was out at Greg Judy's, um, did a little bit of a video with her. She has been the only one. Um, Fallon was her name. And she's been the only one that I knew that was doing stuff in the butcher's trade. Because a lot of the classes we teach, a lot of the women are asking, hey, where are the other women in this trade? And I'm like, I don't know. I met her. And then lo and behold, I come across one who is doing extraordinary stuff. Folks, you're going to want to know. You're going to know more about her and what she's doing. But right off, Tiffany, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and what brought you to this work eventually? Okay, so I grew up in South OKC, so I was a city girl. Um, my fa like my family's from New York. Actually, they moved here. Uh, my dad moved here and stayed. Obviously. So I grew up in this city. I put myself in FFA at the age of 14 and was, you know, scooping ice cream locally to pay for show pigs and uh, moved into cattle after that. And then at 23, I bought a place with some land and started raising poultry and very quickly learned that I was going to have to learn how to butcher some roosters. You know, you, you immediately come up with that problem right away. And so YouTube University got me through my first uh, batch of roosters. And then next thing I knew, um, in, in my personality, I have to preface this by saying it's a zero or 100 for anything for me. And so, <clears throat> of course, I immediately went out and got 140 chickens and thought I was, you know, going to sell some chickens. And so that became a thing. So next thing I knew, I was butchering 100 chickens every few weeks and selling the meat. And, you know, then that kind of turned into um, a whole situation with another local processor that opened up and wanted to shut us down. So the idea came that I was like, if you can't beat them, join them. 
So the original concept for what I'm doing now was a mobile um, poultry unit, a mobile processing unit for poultry. And, um, you know, I ran some numbers and I thought, well, why not, why not do pigs? And if I'm going to do pigs, why not do cows? So now I run the only mobile processing unit in the state of Oklahoma. Um, I only know of a few units in the country. I'm sure there are more. They're just not, um, you know, I can't see them online. I don't know where they are. There's a couple of them in Texas. Those are the only two that I'm aware of. So I'm fully mobile. I kill, cut, and wrap on site, beef, pork, lamb, and goat, and I travel the entire state. Okay. Let me <laughs> let me dial you back a little bit because I know a little bit of having, you know, spent a little time on the phone with you. Um mm -hmm. Folks, the every superhero has an origin story, and in my view, she is a superhero. Um, and it may not be all that pleasant, so we're going to go as far or deep into it because everybody wonders, well, first of all, let me just go ahead and say right off the bat, the overlap that you and I have. First of all, she grew up in South Oklahoma City. I grew up in South Oklahoma City. <laughs> um, her parent. Her parents came from New York, or at least your dad, as I understand it. Well, my wife is from New York, and I was originally came from Pennsylvania. So there's already that overlap. But we also share something else that, you know, in the earlier episodes of this podcast, uh, reluctantly, I talked about it, and it was some of my origin story in terms of I didn't come from the most pleasant place in the world, and you didn't either. Um, would you mind getting into that? Because the idea here, Tiffany, is that, Somebody like you is going to give a lot of people uh, tremendous confidence, just like to a certain extent, I don't like to admit it, but to a certain extent, like maybe I do, because you come from a non-traditional background to this space and you are doing things that nobody ever thought you would do, maybe not even yourself initially. But if you wouldn't mind, maybe get into your origin story about what was life for you, like for you growing up and you know, before you got into this space. Sure. Yeah. So I think a lot of it for me is my grandfather on my mother's side had a, he had a big garden growing up and he passed far too young. He was, uh, I was nine when he passed. And so when he passed, I immediately started gardening. And I think at a very young age, I got addicted to growing my own food. You know, that was something I learned at a really, really young age and I, it was exciting for me. Um, I will say that, you know, kind of what you touched on, my family was not 100% on board with any of it. Um, they were very upset with my choices to move into the agricultural space, so much so um, that I left home at 16. There was a lot of physical and mental, emotional abuse um, all around. I had an alcoholic father. Uh, my mother has her issues mentally and, you know, it, it was a really difficult childhood and, and it, I was doing really well in high school. So it did break my heart, unfortunately, to, you know, to leave school, but they were sending the cops to the school to pick me up and take me back to that environment. And I was desperate to get out of it. So um, I worked my butt off. I worked two jobs pretty much from the day I was 16 Um you know, I tried to put myself through college and I worked two jobs plus went to college. I almost, I fell asleep driving. I almost died. You know, I, I almost fell off of a highway bridge. Yeah. And so that was kind of the, the decision for me that, okay, college maybe is not feasible for me right now. And just within a year of that, I was able to buy a house. Um, and I did try to, you know, salvage a relationship with my parents, but even, you know, after I started getting into poultry, like I couldn't even get them to eat a Thanksgiving turkey I raised. I couldn't, um, there just was never, we were never going to see eye to eye. And, uh, there was a lot of other stuff personally going on between us, but, you know, my father told me as a kid that, you know, you're wasting your high school years wallowing in pig and cow shit. And just was so mean about it. And still to this day, you know, well, well, not to this day, we haven't spoken in six years, but when I was trying to work it out with him and as an adult, they, you know, he went as far as to say, you know, you know where I get my chicken, I get it from the grocery, I get it from Crest. If you're from Oklahoma City, you know what Crest is. Um, you know, they, he would never let go of it. He was always mean about it. And so I just said, you know, I don't need that in my life. This is what I want to do. This is what I'm going to do moving forward. Um, and I think a lot, you know, if you, if you read or watch a lot of Barbara Corker and stuff, she talks a lot about how people who come from like childhood abuse, um, you know, move into the entrepreneurship and 
don't do it so much for the money as they do to prove something. And that's, that's probably something, um, that I can relate to for sure. It's been a rough ride, but you know, here we are. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that ride because honestly, other people having grown up in the same environment you did to a great extent, a lot of the people I know that share our background would have maybe found themselves in the throes of, um, other things that are not necessarily helpful. It sounds like you threw yourself into, um, into really making the best version of yourself, but clearly I, I can't imagine it started off that way. Um, with, with other people that are, that come from your background and mine too, it usually means that they're going to wind up spending a lot of time on the couch of a therapist. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm aware of the influences that are back there, especially in South OKC. Why not you? I mean, is that a road that you considered going down? Did you go down it a while? Is it something you just found repulsive? Why did you go? Why did you zig when a lot of other people would have zagged? Um, you know, that's that's a great question. I, I don't even know that I know the answer to that. I think I threw myself into work because at a young age, it was about survival. I had to survive. I had to figure out how as a 16 year old who couldn't get a credit card, who couldn't get an apartment, who couldn't, you know, I had all these things going against me. I barely could get a job. I had to explain to people why I wasn't in school. And so I just had to kind of maneuver my way at a younger age. And so I threw myself into working all these jobs because I, I learned, OK, well, if I work hard enough, um, I can make myself, you know, somewhat comfortable. And then I, that just um I don't know where the entrepreneurship has come from that really uh, maybe I should sit on a, a therapist couch and work, work, work my way through that. I'm sure there's some definitely deep rooted childhood trauma related things there. Um, but I bartended for 12 years. I was in the restaurant industry for 16 years. Um, and I surrounded my, I, in that space, I was surrounded by a lot of other like entrepreneurs. I was working in a prime steakhouse. I had a lot of high-end clients that, um, you know, were really influential. And I, I was working with some people, um, some other servers actually, who turned me on to Tony Robbins. I don't know if you ah, know who Tony Robbins yes, is. Yes, I do. Okay. Awaken the Giant Within was one of the books I read. Yeah, right up. Yeah, from the very yeah. beginning. So Tony Robbins, this, this colleague of mine, he probably thought I was never even going to listen to this audiobook, but I lost, I listened to it twice back to back because that actually was what influenced me to start what became Freeland Farms. And then, um, you know, I had a really tough year in 2018. I lost a lot of animals. I lost a lot of honeybees and I was really, really struggling mentally about, okay, what am I doing? Do I need to do something different? Do I, you know, just reevaluating everything I was doing. And so, I actually threw myself into a seminar of Tony Robbins down in Dallas, life changing experience. And, you know, for people listening, if you, you don't have to agree with everything Tony Robbins says, but he, there is a lot of stuff that he's really good at. And what he's really, really good at, in my opinion, is helping people figure out what they want. He's really good at asking questions um, for you to ask yourself. And so, cause a lot of times I feel like people just don't ask the right questions. So I'm asking these questions. Okay, what do I want my look, my life to look like? What is it that makes me happy? And um, essentially, you know, I keep coming back to agriculture. I keep coming back to homesteading. I keep coming back to growing my own food, and you know how that makes me feel healthier and help happier. And you know, I love raising animals. And there's a lot of pride that comes into putting your own food on the table. It tastes better. I mean, we could go on and on for days about that. But um, I think that's kind of been a huge influence to me. And, you know, I'll shout out to Keith Pratt for that. Um, he's, he's the one who introduced me to Tony Robbins who changed my life. Yeah. He was a big influence in my life as well. And, um, you know, other people that kind of in the same realm, like, uh, Andy Frisella and a number of others, um, we'll talk more maybe about some of the other, uh, things that might even, you know, help even further. But yeah, it seems like in just about every single way, you and I have a lot of overlap in terms of how we started and, and to a certain extent how we got to this place. Although, you know, there may be a little bumps and bruises along the way. Um, how does a 16 year old. OK, so you moved out. You're I know it's a. how are you doing it? Where were you living? I mean, <laughs> how are you what were you doing for food? 
up until that time, I mean, because I can't imagine you're making a, as a, you know enough to meet all your needs just working job after job after job. I mean, what you know, take me through that. What does that look like? What what is the life of a 16 year old all 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 by yourself? Clearly, there's a lot of danger around. How did you navigate things? Uh, it was rough. So I did start like babysitting at 13. I was working at an ice cream shop at 15. So I had saved up a little money when I did leave. I had some cash on me. So that really got me through <laughs> some, you know, the food part, at least. Um, I stayed at random places for a long time. I was, you know, working in the mornings at PetSmart and I was working at nights as a lifeguard at Whitewater, um, worked the later shift. So I was working most of the day. I didn't need to be anywhere but at work for that period of time. And I was, you know, bumming rides here and there um, until eventually I got a vehicle um, that would, it was honestly, it should have been totaled like five times at that point. It leaked. The first gear did not work. It had a crack against the windshield. I held it together with pink duct tape. I kid you not. I was driving this thing around to get to work. It was, I did the, the fuel gauge didn't even work on it. It would run out of gas and I wouldn't even know. It, <laughs> it was a nightmare. Um, but yeah, I bounced around. I was at one aunt's place for a little while. I was at another aunt's place for a little while. And then I was in with a boyfriend for um, a while and then he was in the military. So he actually got shipped out but I was able to sublease his apartment as a 17 year old. So no, no, my name was not on anything. Then at 18, I moved into my own apartment uh, again, still working my butt off. I started working for a period honest for a few years. And then I was, that's when I started serving um, at night at Hooters of all places. Um, I, you know, I'm not ashamed of any part of my story. So I worked there for a while and that's when I got introduced into the service industry as an 18 year old and found out, wow, this is a this is a game I can win at because at Hooters there's a there's this whole corporate, um, you know, they have this whole corporate structure for making extra money, and I think you know one of the things was you sell a certain beer, you sell a certain food item, you sell a certain merch item. Well, I was winning international contests for selling more like Oktoberfest beer than any other mm. single server in the in the world. And that was really cool. So I'm going, Oh, this is like, I can make great money doing this. That's how I furnished my apartment was winning that deal at Hooters. I literally won a gift card and furnished like it was a thousand dollar gift card. I went out and bought furniture for the first time. Wow. Um, and so after that, you know, I immediately knew I wanted to learn to bartend and I knew that was going to be a good money maker. And I just kind of thrived in that industry for a long time. You meet a lot of people, you make a lot of good contacts. Um, and I've always been a people person. So that came naturally to me. It was, um, I just had to learn kind of more about food because I'd been so sheltered in South OKC. We, you know, we didn't eat more than beef and pork most of the time. Maybe so Del Rancho's every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. So there was a little bit of a, a learning curve there, but um, yeah, I, that's, that's what I did. That's how I survived. You know, like I said, I bought this place at 23 and now, uh, it's been almost 10 years looking to well, buy. That's extraordinary. So you yeah. were learning over, even at Hooters, you were learning how to hustle. I mean, you were show you were unlike so many people in this world and especially young people like yourself. Um, you're, you're looking at these lessons as serious life lessons and how do I improve from it? So it sounds like you start with the Tony Robbins thing. You're finding out nooks and crannies and all these different ways in which you can hustle and improve yourself. Right. Well, then at some point along the way, you become something of a, um, you get involved with bees. How does that, how did you make that transition? Um, it's, it's, it's extraordinary really how you start and how and where you are. Um, I know you're not at all done with this journey, but how did you make that transition into bees? So, like I said, I bought this place at 23. It's got a few acres on it. And um, I immediately am putting in a garden because that was my first love as a child. And I love gardening. I still do. And I put in a bunch of fruit trees. I was really excited to put in trees because, I mean, if you do any reading on homesteading and I was addicted to learning about homesteading. So you got to know that I'm going to the library and I'm picking up books. And one of the first things anyone tells you is plant your fruit trees first, right? Because they take so long to establish. So I'm planting dozens of fruit trees and I'm thinking, I, you know what, I'm going to need some bees to pollinate these. Also, bees are fascinating 
And uh, I started reading about the honeybees and I'd read four or five books on honeybees. And I just ordered some bees locally, went to pick them up, had no clue what I was doing. I was completely out of you know, I had no idea what was going on. Luckily, I reached out to our local club and I had a couple of people help me out, show me, you know, they came out here and helped me go through them. And I went to look at some of their bees um, and I immediately was hooked. I'm like, this is going to be an addiction. I can already feel it happening. And I remember it explicitly when it turned into a business, because at, at one point I started with just two hives. And there's a local club, Central Oklahoma Beekeeping Association. Somebody had posted on the Facebook page that they had these bees that moved into a soffit of their house and they couldn't afford the removal. They had been quoted like $2,000 for removal. This guy is like a disabled veteran. He's pulling at my heartstrings. And I just told him, I said, look, I have no clue uh, how to do that. Matter of fact, I'm barely even a beekeeper at this point, but... I'll be, I'll go try. Like, I'll try it. We'll see what happens. Worst case scenario. I'm, you know, I'm going to do it for free. I mess something up. Like we'll find somebody else that knows what they're doing. Right. So I went out there and it worked out. I mean, I was watching YouTube videos of how to put together a bee vacuum, uh, at the bar. And I was going to Walmart at like 3 AM picking up supplies to make this bee vacuum. I kid you not, I can't make this up. And I remember being so broke at that point. I think I spent my last like $300 on a ladder. So I didn't have a ladder tall enough. So I go to this guy's house and I do this removal. So really it wasn't for free. It really cost me money, but I got up there. I did the removal. It worked out. I couldn't believe it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can do this. And at that point in time, there wasn't TikTok. There weren't videos on bee removals. There was like, I had looked everywhere. I remember buying the one book available on Amazon and it comes in like, the, it was like a, somebody threw together like a scrapbook of stuff or something with this cheap binder on it. You know, there were no books on removals. There were no YouTube videos on it. You were you know, you were lucky to find any information. So I was just winging it, honestly. Um, I was trying to find as much as I could online. And then, so then I went and did another one for free. And then that ended up being probably one of the biggest ones I did. I think I ended up being at this lady's house, like 12 hours doing this removal. It was, it was awful. It was huge. I was using like yard tools to get all the way back into this subfloor to pull out all this honeycomb. Wow. And yeah, yeah. So, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm not doing a very good job. I think I killed every hive for the first six months. Um, you know, that's, that sucks. That was a hard learning curve, but eventually, you know, I started charging just a little bit, hundred bucks here, 200 bucks there, got really, really good at it. Um, matter of fact, I ditched the bee vacuum altogether. Now I can do a removal in about 30 minutes. I catch that queen, I leave her there and I come back and, you know, inside of that journey, what was also happening is I started reaching out to other beekeepers across the country because one of the things Tony Robbins says is if you want to learn how to do something, you find someone already doing it. Now, nobody locally was going to help me learn how to do bee removals or get better at this because they see me as a competitive threat, right? And I mean, they'll, they'll go as far uh, as to give you bad information just to throw you off your game. And I, I hate to say that about the community because I love the beekeeping community, but it's true. Yes, so it I reached out to a commercial beekeeping page on Facebook and I said, look, I'm looking to learn. Here's your cheap labor. And I mean to tell you, people were flying me out to Florida, Virginia, North Dakota, South Carolina, New York, Texas, Kansas, everywhere. And I was working, next thing I know, I'm working 1,200 hives on the East Coast for four years. I'm managing these hives, doing splits. And, it, you know, what happened was I had a guy, he told me, he said, we need to mark every single queen in this yard, 1,200 hives. Well, I can tell you where a queen is in about five minutes now. So I honed in on those skills. You know, we harvested semi loads of honey in North Dakota. Okay, got really good at that. And uh, we started breeding queens in New York. Okay, learned how to do that. It's just, I started accumulating these skills commercially. I actually wanted to go commercial as a beekeeper myself. I just can't do it in Oklahoma. Um, 
and nobody will give you money for it. The FSA won't loan you money for it. And it's a huge risk investment um, because it is considered livestock and they are dying off at, you know, 50% plus rates every single year. So you're talking about huge, huge risk investment. Nobody will, um, We'll loan you money for that. So I had to kind of give up on that dream, but I still do the removals locally. Um, and I still love that. I just, I did quit, I did quit working commercially, you know, when I opened backyard butchery, just due to time. I can't do well, let's Let's move right into that. Um, I'll tell you what, kid, you're, you're making my day because, um, not having is no reason for not getting. And, um, you're extraordinary. And I think you're going to do so much to help so many people out there. I mean, you have a go get it that is not common with a lot of folks these days. And I don't care where they fall within the age range. Um, you're doing, I know you don't know a whole lot about me, but honestly, the way I had to learn a lot of what I'm into is doing the very same thing you had to do where you're like going, okay, I will find someone to teach me this. When I was getting into butcher's trade, it was like every hipster this side of the Mississippi was getting into it and I couldn't get my way in the door. And they're thinking, Oh, this guy's too old. And then I did, I begged, borrowed, still did everything I possibly could to get myself in the door, just as you're describing right there. And then also let me also point this out, but let it not be a point of discouragement to a number of folks out there. I couldn't agree more, Tiffany, in terms of the people that are potential competitors doing everything they possibly can to put you on a bad lead or instead of being cooperative, they see you as competition. And instead of raising their game, they're over there out there trying to destroy you. So I can definitely, I mean, good night, man. There's so many different ways I can absolutely relate to that, but it didn't stop you. And you were absolutely smart about doing that. So now you have a wealth of knowledge from so many different bases that any, any other competitor can't possibly compete. How many of these people work with different keepers with different knowledge all throughout this country? And then all of a sudden you take, you nobody can take away the knowledge you have. But somehow, some way, you wind up doing what you're doing today. Now we got to make that transition into that. Okay, so how does a okay, how does a homeless 16 year old <laughs> that became a um, a server who became a number of other things who became a bomb beekeeper get into doing what you are doing this day? How did you make that transition? I got to know how this happened. Okay. So it's kind of a silly story. Um, like I said, I, I, the next step after gardening and beekeeping, I started getting into chickens, right? I learned how to butcher them, YouTube university. And then I immediately was like, oh, well I can put some chicken in the freezer. I can put chicken in other people's freezers. And what really got me into buying so many, the first round was tractor supply had like a 99 cent sale and I cannot refuse a good deal. So I'm like, why not? I've got the land. I'll build a little uh, Salatin style, you know, meat poultry pen. Um, immediately failure, by the way, because the neighbor's dogs came and destroyed that pen and killed almost all of those chickens that night. Um, or one night, not that night, but like a couple months down the road. And so that, but it didn't stop me. Obviously I built a better pen. I moved forward. I, you know, eventually got LGDs and uh, livestock guard dogs for people listening. And then, um, you know, started picking off stray dogs. Unfortunately, I had to deal with that in my own way. But um, what I was doing was I was posting online. I, I eventually I had opened to this, you know, Freeland Farms is now a thing on Facebook at this time. And I'm posting online, hey, I'm butchering this weekend. If anybody has any roosters they need done, like feel free to bring them by. And I kind of thought of it as, okay, I'm going to help the community. Um, and also that money can go towards this equipment because I did have to invest in a plucker, in a scalder. And, you know, it wasn't a ton of money, but it to me it was at the time. It was a lot of money. So I thought, well, that'll help, you know, kind of recover some of that investment in the equipment. And of course, people are showing up with five, six roosters, you know, 4-H projects. And it, and it really was never, it never amounted to a lot of extra birds. It was maybe, you know, 25 extra birds a week and that I was doing for the public. And the state knew what I was doing. And there were five or six other poultry farms kind of doing a similar thing 
that I was doing. And they even like inspected their equipment, um, told them to keep certain logs. Um, and then uh, one lady specifically got a $10,000 grant from the Oklahoma State Department of Food and Forestry for this poultry processing. So I say that because someone opened a processing, a state inspected processing unit for poultry and rabbit two hours away from me. She sneakily gets online, has a friend get online, privately message me, asks questions in a way. Um, and I wasn't thinking anything of it, but she, she did it in a way that got all of us in trouble. Um, I had already known that these other people that were processing poultry, these other farmers, they had reached out to me and said, hey, we've been contacted by ODAF. We've been told we can't process for other people. I'd been dodging their phone call. I knew they'd been trying to call me. I was trying to figure out what was going on. Well, they showed up at my doorstep. And uh, my first piece of advice is if you ever have a state inspector or investigator or anything like that at your, at your house, ask to see the complaint. Ask to see it. And so I did. I said, okay, let's see what it is. And I knew immediately who that conversation was. It was a Facebook message. And like I said, she asked all the right questions just to get me in trouble. And so, you know, at that point, it had never been a real issue. The state didn't care what we were doing, but it, was, it wasn't it was a problem until it was a problem, right? Until someone was complaining. And so um, essentially they told me you can't butcher chickens for the public for money. And I said, cool, can I do it for free? Well, I was like, okay, cool. So can I charge them for the bag? I put it in then. Okay, technically, yeah. Technically, I can charge it as a classroom, but I cannot charge you to butcher your chicken. It is asinine. It is so stupid. And I have to explain this to people all the time because they're like, Tiffany, can you come butcher our chickens or can we bring you chickens? And I'm going, yeah, sure. But um, just for legal purposes, it's going to be sold as a classroom. I'm going to teach you how you're going to help me. And that's what's going to happen. And um, essentially, I was uh, I was kind of pissed off about it because I don't like people who are sneaky. I don't like people who are manipulative like that. I thought, you know, if anything, I had actually been sending this person business. And so had all the other farmers that were involved in this. Um, we actually tried to change the laws, the poultry laws, because Oklahoma, Oklahoma has some of the strictest poultry laws in the country. Um, we're supposed to be an agricultural state, but that's kind of a joke. It's a big agricultural state, not a small agricultural state. And I think it's mm -hmm. important to, I think it's really important to make that difference difference because small farmers are in a chokehold most of the time. And so we tried to change the laws that that didn't work out so great. Um, you know, I looking back, there's some things I definitely would like to do differently. And, and I just lost time in order to get that done. Money and time. Um, we were up against, you know, obviously the big boys, the, the Tysons, the Pilgrim's pride. And, um, uh, that's when the attitude of, well, if you can't beat them, join them. So originally, again, it was going to be a mobile poultry unit. Um, and I ran numbers. I didn't like what the numbers looked like. I had recently brought a couple of feeder pigs that I had raised to a local shop and I was really upset with what I got back. So I had already been started moving into butchering pork. Um, cause I'd raised pork, you know, like I said, I raised some pigs when I was younger, I knew what I was doing. I was really upset when I got meat back. That was literally inedible. Like, I don't even know what I got back. It was so disgusting. I didn't even want to give it to my dogs. And I was really upset cause I had spent like 750 bucks, which is basically what I charge now. And that was like 10 years ago. That's um, insane. it is insane. It was insane because I spent a fortune on it. There was a lot of stuff that went wrong. Um, the kill shot did not go well. They did do that here. I paid extra for them to come to my house to do the kill here. Cause I've always believed that your animals should, you know, be dispatched at home. I think that is the most ethical thing for them. Um, that is the least stressful and there's proven scientific facts that a less stressed animal is going to taste better. So, um, I didn't go through eight months, nine months of, you know, effort just for that to get something back in edible. So I was like, well, um, I can, I can do better than that. I mean, I have this little disease. It's got, it's called, um, if he can do it, I can. So I'm like looking at this person going, I'm at least as smart as this person. I'm at least as smart as this person butchering these pigs. I can figure out how to do this. If they can figure it out, I can figure it out. So I had moved into, you know, doing pigs and I started running numbers and, you know, this was like 2015 or 16. I originally uh, reached out to the state and they actually turned down the concept of a mobile processing unit. Um, 
it wasn't until COVID I was pushed out of the restaurant industry, obviously, like everyone was. And my beekeeping business was booming. 2020 was one of the best years I had. It was fantastic. And I remember my manager at the restaurant kept texting me. He's like, do you want me to put you on the schedule? And I, I had told him initially, like, let the kids, because I was in Norman at the time. I was like, let those kids take the shifts. They need it. My business is doing well. I'm, I'm making money over here. And I knew the whole staff was struggling. So I kept letting those other people take the shifts. And then whenever they were fully open, I kind of just realized, like, I, I don't want to go back. I didn't want to go back. I'd had some time away from it. And that really, you know made me realize like this wasn't making me happy. I was not fulfilled in any way. Um, and I was reevaluating what I was doing. And that's when I thought, you know, let's, let's revisit this idea of a mobile unit. I mean, I was thinking about what can I do to make money? And I thought, I, I mean, I went as far as thinking, okay, I can go buy a tractor. I can do different types of tractor work. I can run equipment. When I was working commercially with beekeepers, I was running bobcats. I was running Hummer bees. I was running Avantis. I was running these, these machines. I was like, I can do that. Um, but let's revisit this idea first. And I did revisit it and I'll be damned if they approved it. Now there are new, there were new people in the, uh, in that office at that time. I don't know if that's what it was, but when I did get inspected, they told me I should have never been turned down in 2015. And that was pretty upsetting, but, um, you know, it doesn't change the fact that, you know, I'm open now. And, uh, like I said, we ran, I ran numbers and <clears throat> poultry just wasn't going to cut it for a mobile unit. There's not enough demand for one. And, you know, at eight bucks a head, you're just never going to make, you're never going to make it happen. There's, there's no way. So started looking into pork and then I'm going, okay, well, if I'm going to build a unit to hold a 600 pound pig, I'm going to do a 600 pound steer. That only makes sense. And I remember explicitly the state actually told me, they said, you're never going to do a 600 pound pig. I want you to know, I've already done a dozen of those and a thousand pound pig. So, <laughs> wow. so yeah. That's where we're at. It's Tiffany, let me, let me. No, no, it's it. In so many ways, I I absolutely can relate. Um, what what absolutely floors me more than anything, with all the things going on, I don't. This is why I don't understand why everybody wants government to solve their problems, when your story is a clear example of how government is the problem. It is where we can do a side by side. Okay those Tyson people that they work on the behalf of, you know, it's funny, Joel Salatin did a side by side of the one that he butchers in open air compared to the ones done in the Tyson factory and the number of pathogens that are on those chickens that are butchered outside, as opposed to the ones that are done in this so-called clean facility. It's staggering how much junk is in this place. And of course, honestly, birds that have no business, I mean, that are tortured from the day they're born until the time they're put into that plastic bag. Here you are out there trying to live this American dream, and they're doing everything they can. I, I just can't believe in the pantheon of all the stupid things that are going on in Oklahoma right now, that they're going to shake you down because you are processing chickens. It's not like you're stealing somebody. You're not, you're not out there on a, on a cattle rustle stealing anybody's stock and then putting it in the pot and selling it off. You're doing it at the behest of the people that want it done. Yeah, but and they're I, have, still. I have to say, though, I have to cut you off there because it really wasn't the state that had a problem with it. It was the lady who opened a facility she wanted to monopolize an industry. And she's two hours away. I'm going, how am I competing with you two hours away? People aren't going to take three roosters to Shakota. You know, and I'll say it out loud. I have no problem. Well, the, the, fact, that, the fact that the government would even entertain Right. The idea is the concern is that in the pantheon of all the things that are going on. Yeah, you have. And this is more of that backbiting nonsense that I can't stand where clearly you're not even a competitor in that. But you know what, Tiffany, you're doing incredible things. That is, I, I think, after this interview and a few other things that may potentially go on, I think this whole country is going to know your name when it's all said and done, because you are doing extraordinary things. And by anybody's measurement, I got to know because we didn't cover it. Well, at least I know the answer because I asked you before, but <laughs> how did you make that transition? It's one thing to go out there and butcher a chicken. <laughs> it's entirely another to go out there and butcher anything that is on four feet. How did you make that transition? How did you learn? 
you got to tell that story. Yeah. So um, obviously in pork, I immediately started again, looking for people doing this. And I have made a great companion out of Bad Baxter Farm. They are doing a lot. They were originally doing poultry classes and originally doing pork classes. And I had attended both of them. And that really helped me because I got to see it in real life. I got to see it up close and personal. And I, I thank her endlessly for what she's done for me um, in that space. But then when it came to beef, that was the big thing. You know, I started building backyard butchery and it was a, it was a year and seven month process to get this trailer built. Um, keep in mind, I was building it during COVID. There's a shortage of everything and um, just getting someone to work on it because I'm not capable of doing a lot of the welding that's inside of that, that unit, um, nor would I want to attempt to with what it's being used for. So I reached out to every butcher in like a 60 mile radius and in within Oklahoma City, you know, that's a lot of facilities, actually. And I got turned down. Everybody turned me down. There was one lady who took me up on it and she very quickly changed her mind about it. And I was told later, you know, you were learning too much too quick. And I said, well, that was the point, you know, and I offered to work for free. She could have had free labor for a year and seven months. The irony being that she sold that she sold that place like two years later. So that was a huge mistake on her part. But, um, you know, I had actually hoped to work in conjunction with these these stores because I actually built this unit with a 10,000 pound rail capacity. That means I could put up to eight head of cattle on that rail comfortably. Um, and I can actually legally go and do on farm slaughter and I could haul to any butcher shop. I've got the paperwork to do it. I've got the tags to do it. Um, I thought in the initial building of backyard butchery that that was going to be a big part of my business, but I have not done one because mm. the industry is this way, you know, and I just, the, the expo that actually got my name to you last weekend, um, I actually did meet a lot of young butchers there. And I, and I originally remember being kind of perturbed that I was, I was invited to this event. They asked me to come and I, I see there's four other butchers that are going to be there. I was like, come on guys. But then I got there and in my true fashion, I just introduced myself, you know, hi, my name's Tiffany. I butcher. What's your name? And, and next thing I know, we were, you know, sharing meals and having laughs and having a great time. And I realized that a lot of that is just an old mindset that is older butcher mindset. And I'm, I'm meeting these young butchers who are literally saying the exact same thing as me. And I said, you guys, why don't we all get together? Why don't we help each other? You know, I recently injured my wrist real badly. Okay. I could have used some help for sure. Um, there's always situations where we're not going to be um, available or something comes up, emergencies happen. Like, why aren't we supporting each other? Why don't we have butcher's club? Why don't we have butcher's club? Why don't we help each other out? Because something that I have been saying about beekeeping, I've been saying it about farming. I've been saying it about butchering is that we get further together than we will ever get trying to work solo. And I just, I have proven it over and over and over again. And for some reason there's this, you know, this each, everybody's out for their own mindset, you know, this cut. Well, there's more mindset. demand. There's more demand out there than you could possibly fill. Exactly. So cooperation yeah. works out better. Yes. And, and the more of us that there are, maybe the more people that'll be encouraged to raise their own meat if they don't have a two year wait at the butcher shop. You know, during COVID, sure. it, was, it was a two year wait during COVID. Um, people were selling butcher dates on Craigslist. It was unreal what was going on. I was like, this is impossible. You're putting up to you're basically having to make a butcher date before an animal is born. How does that make sense? You know, most people are butchering cattle at 18 months. OK, what? You got to make a butcher date for an animal before it's even born. How does that make sense? That's how busy we are. And so there's so much business to go around. And like the more of us that there are, the more, more people that can, um, you know, spread this word who can get, you know, we want to, we want to expand into the city people. We want to show these, you know, we want to show the city people that how much better this meat is and uh, maybe encourage them to raise their own meat. And backyard butchery has a big influence on that because I don't have minimums. I come to you. You don't even need to have a trailer. You can bring home some pigs and a small calf in the back of your pickup and you don't have to deal with it after that. You don't have to move it. And so, you know, that is also a huge influence for me or a huge motivator for me is to try and, um, you know, educate people um, 
I teach classes on how to butcher. I've gotten so irritated with the, you know, this whole industry, the gatekeeping that I said, you know what, I'm going to teach classes and I'm going to do it for cheap. I cheat. I, I teach poultry classes for like 25 bucks. You want to learn how to bring, bring some birds, 25 bucks. Let's go. Um, I'll do hog classes for a hundred. We did two beef classes that sold out in like three hours last year for the very first time we did a beef class in Oklahoma. Nobody else was doing them. Um, 200 bucks. Come on out full breakdown. And I will answer any questions you have. And, you know, whether those people go on to butcher their own animals or not, you know, they've seen the process and a lot of people just become so much more comfortable with it. They're like, wow, that wasn't nearly as awful as I thought it would be, you know, or I had no idea so many cuts came on an animal. You know, we only see the five at the grocery store and, you know, and they're ripping you off. Right. And then, and then they're saying, well, now I feel more comfortable just buying a cow from someone or, you know, and then you've got farmers who are like, well, now if I can't get you to come out for me, I can feel comfortable, you know, at least putting down an animal that's injured or downed, or I can maybe try to salvage something out of that animal. And so, you know, I'm just building this community of people and, um, I want us, to, I want us to all come together. And it's really, it's really been beautiful because the people who get it, get it. You're going to knock this thing so far out of the park with your ambition. You know, I say it all the time. You can go after Moby Dick in a rowboat and take the tartar sauce with you. Um, that's, that's the way my wife rolls. And there aren't a whole lot of people that have, that can come from your background uh, do and accomplish all the incredible things that you have and then be at this point right now where I know for a fact, looking at the climate in terms of where things are going with animal processing and all these other things, that you're going to hit this thing in terms of teaching, in terms of you name it. If there's anything involved in the butchery space, I know that you are going to knock it out of the park because it seems to me that you are not content to take no for an answer and um, it seems to me also that um, there's no stopping you. And with that mindset and with that attitude, I can't even begin to imagine the number of people out there that are going to benefit from our joint knowledge. And I'm talking to people like myself too, where, you know, I talked to you briefly that I got my best friend. He's back there. He's got some animals to process. And I'm like, okay, just so happens I come across you. Maybe you and I can collaborate. And uh, maybe we learn a couple of tricks from each other because that's what happens when butchers work together is yes. that there may be like, for example, one trick I showed, I was breaking down a pig for a class and there was another butcher there that I was training. And I showed him this little trick I learned from this French guy where you separate the picnic ham from the Boston butt. He had never seen it before. He's butchered. I don't know how many pigs he had never seen it before. Well, that's a little trick that he learned from me. But then on the same token, Dealing with the trotters on the pigs, there was a little technique and this little hook thing that he made and the way that he did it that I learned from him. And I've been at this game a very long time. So when you cooperate and you collaborate with, you know, so many other people out there, you realize, hey, there might be a better way of doing this or they may, you know, cross pollinate with you and figure out there's a way that you do that also helps them. But here's what I want everybody out there to think about. Look. I could be down the street from Tiffany in Oklahoma right now, and neither one of us would touch the demand that currently exists. I haven't been in Oklahoma for years. I live in North Carolina now, but the same thing is happening out here. And then you find out like, and I think that's a wonderful thing that you're doing is that you create something, a maybe a butcher's guild that you and your other friends like, okay, you know what? Hey, y'all, I'm up to my eyeballs right now. Or like you said, I'm injured. My wrist is messed up. Can any of you kind of, you know, so I don't get in a bad way with some of my customers here. Can you fill the demand until I can get back on my feet? That's how we do it. And that's exactly what you're building out there to a certain extent is what I'm trying to build out here. So, um, Tiffany, I mean, you give me incredible hope in terms of how many young people like yourself, I guess, you know, you're young to me anyway. Um, how many young people like yourself can go out there and do extraordinary things? And it all, I also want to say that it seems like where so many people said COVID was the worst thing that ever happened to them. It sounds to me that it might be the best thing that ever happened to you. Am I wrong in making that assumption? No, it was great. It was a good thing for me because really it just made me look inward. 
you know, and maybe again, asking the right questions. I'm going, okay, I, I had to be kind of in tune with my own feelings. And I was going, why am I feeling so, you know, uncomfortable with the idea of going back to bartending? Why is this so uncomfortable for me? Why am I so just not wanting to do this? And I had to ask it. And I said, well, I just don't want to. Simple, simple as that. I didn't want Good to. Enough. You know, it wasn't fulfilling me anymore. I had really come as far as I was ever going to come as a bartender. You know, I had I had done the beer bar with 400 beers. I'd done the wine. We worked at the largest uh, wine selection in the state. I worked at a rest, you know, fine dining. Um, I'd gone to Napa and, and I got really into wine for a while and got really into beer, got really into craft cocktails. I was like, I've literally just kind of I've made full circle at this. I was plateaued at that point. There was not much more growth for me. And I'm a person who's continuous, like continuously trying to grow as a person and in my field. So, and that's why I really like what you're saying about learning a little something from everybody. And I learned that in beekeeping when I started working for all these commercial beekeepers across the country, because you may learn a tiny nugget from every single person and you may learn what not to do just as well as you might learn what to do. And I think that's just as, it's just as helpful. So, you know, um, you take all of that and you put it together and, and now you've got this incredible, you know, wealth of knowledge and, you know, become more efficient. You become, um, just altogether a better, better person, more well-rounded person and in your field and as a human. So, um, I really like what you're saying about that. And, and as far as like putting together a guild, I really would love to see that happen. I don't know why we don't have one already. Honestly, it, it baffles me. I'm like, there's not even a Facebook page. You know right. what I mean? Like what is going on there? You know, there are spaces I have found. Um, there's like a female butcher's room on Facebook. I will say there's some women there that I have found butchering. I recently went down to Texas and while I was there, I met up with a fabulous a uh, wild game butcher down in Texas, and she's going to come up and we're going to butcher a pig together. Um, she's going to buy one of the pigs that I've raised and and she's going to take it home with her and we're going to have a great time. She also has a podcast. And, you know, if you come down here, we'll butcher a couple pigs. I am completely open to working with everybody because I guarantee you there's more that you can teach me than I can teach you. I'm still very much learning my trade um, and becoming more efficient. I will say this last year, now that I've been open a full year, has been massive, massive growth for me. I mean, everything that could possibly have gone wrong has gone wrong, um, at least twice, honestly. Everything that could break has broken. You know, I, I'm doing something that's never been done um, this way, particularly. There are mobile units, like I said, in Texas. They're very, very different because each state has different laws. So like in Texas, they're required to skin inside of that trailer. Okay, so they're, they have built their unit very differently than mine. Um, and I actually got to be a little bit a part of that um, process for, and it's another woman in Texas, um, but she has a boyfriend and some kids that help her. I go completely solo. I did try to hire people in the beginning that hasn't been working out super great just yet, um, but I'm hoping moving forward to be hiring people really soon. But um, I'm actually glad I've ran solo because it's given me an opportunity to get really, really, um, you know, intimate with this equipment and learning this equipment and learning this process and just trying to fine tune it as much as possible. And the stories I could tell you from the last year would blow your mind. I mean, everything from I've done emergency C-sections to animals that would not die um, despite a good shot. I mean, incredibly long shots, aggressive animals, massive animals. Um, it's just the crazy, I was in a tornado, you know, I went to a job to butcher a bull and I got to stay for a tornado. You know, the, the craziest stuff has happened last year. I really should write it down because it could probably be a bestseller at this point. Um, you really should. It's, um, it's crazy. It's been a crazy ride. Well, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to following your journey. Um, you know, before we bring everything to a close, I got to know, I mean, given your so many hats you've worn so far, um, I I'm just expecting fantastic things out of you. Where do you, where do you see this ultimately going? I mean, is this, um, are you perfectly content where you are? Where do you see yourself maybe a year from now, maybe five years from now? Do you, do you have dreams that expand? I know this is a rhetorical question. I have never asked you this, but where do you see it going from here? 
Um, I think we all know the answer to that is that I'm, I'm definitely not going to be content where I'm at. We're going to keep growing. Um, you know, after I remember when I first started building backyard butchery, there was so much pushback um, from butchers, from farmers. They're, well, you have to hang it. OK, well, you can't do that. You can't cut hot meat. You can't grind hot meat. You can't do this. You can't do that. And I'm, I'm just proving all of that wrong. And I'm telling you, I have a year's worth of customers that are telling you this beef is amazing. We aged it at home. It was incredible. Tender, everything we wanted. And they know for a fact they got all their animal back and they know for a fact they got their animal back. And that is the biggest complaint in this industry. Yes. I'm solving that, but I'm also solving a niche of down and injured animals. Okay in the industry we're in with the economy, the way it is, if you can salvage something out of an animal in that situation, that's a win, um, in farming for sure, you know? And so even people that have a butcher, they love, they still got my number in their phone because when one shows up with a broken leg, guess who they're calling me because they have no one else they can call. And if they can get a 500 pounds, 600 pounds of ground beef back, that's again, that's a win. That's something you can take back other than just burying this animal and taking the total loss. So, I'm filling that niche. I'm also fulfilling a niche of, um, like I said, the crate, I call it, I say that I, I specialize in, in injured and crazy. Um, I did one yesterday like that. It had an attitude problem. And so I was shooting a gun from on top of the, you know, fence over there. I have a great video of it on Instagram and, um, I'm dealing with the aggressive animals. I'm dealing with the unloadable animals. I'm solving these problems. And so what moving forward, I think having a second unit for Oklahoma specifically for those emergency situations, that's the number one thing. Cause I mean, just last week or the week before last, I think I had 10 calls for emergencies. Okay. I can't physically do 10 calls in, in a week. Like I can only do one cow a day, maybe two if they're small. So that's, that's one of the first needs. And I also would like to have one for educational purposes. Maybe someone runs one here. Um, I've been invited, I've already been invited out of the state several times to start teaching classes elsewhere. Well, that would be great. That would be super fun for me. Um, I would love to keep spreading the wealth of knowledge, you know, and learning. I, again, I'll be learning more from other people as well. And that's something that I'm really passionate about is continuing to learn. So, um, I see wild, a wild game facility being open. Once I, I'm looking at building um, a house and buying some property and I feel like I'll get enough acreage that I can start putting together a little wild game facility and I have somebody in mind to run that. And beyond that, again, I have more. I'm not even done yet. Uh, oh, I have no doubt on that score. Expanding into Texas, North Texas is, is number one. Um, surrounding states, number two. Um, I may consider a full USDA facility at some point. That's kind of a, that is a really big one to bite off. So um, I'll, I'll think more on that. that. That'll probably end up happening maybe, you know, further down the line. But yeah, I'm also, you know, I also am after the perfect pork carcass. I raise these beautiful Gloucester old spots. Um, they're UK bloodline and I, pasture feed and way feed these animals or way finish these animals. And I started, you know, raising my own cattle. And so now we're talking about, I use those animals for my classes here, but I'm also selling that meat as well. So, um, I am continuously trying to find the ways to raise the best tasting meat, you know, and that's a personal thing that I'm after, of course. Um, and I think that's a big part of how all this started as well is just, you know, putting my own meat in my own freezer and I'm not going to stop doing that. But now we're going to start putting it in some other people's freezers as well, because I'd like to see more people buying from farmers direct. And um, whether it's me or someone else, I don't care. I would just like to see more farmers getting, you know, more of those sales and less of those corporate farms getting those sales. Well, before we bring uh, Tiffany, you, you're, you're something else. Um, and I'm, I think everybody out there is going to be like, where has she been my whole life, man? The, this is exactly what they need to hear from somebody. It's one thing to hear it from me, some guy that grew up in South Oklahoma city. And then I do what I do right now, but here it is. You're the female version of me. It's like a, like a, a child of mine to a certain extent. I'm that old, um, to where we almost have the same background. Um, and you're doing in your own way, the very things, if you were to take everything that I've said, as far as where I've started and where I am, the overlap that you and I share is extraordinary and honestly astonishing. How do people get a hold of you, Tiffany? 
Yeah. So I'm all over social media, Instagram, Facebook, um, TikTok, Backyard Butchery. Um, that's with a Y at the end. Email is Tiffany at BackyardButchery.com. And I mean, I'll throw my number out there. People can get on, get on uh, any of those, obviously have message, you know, ways to message me there, but you can also just call me direct, text me direct at 405-887-3066. Throw it in your number for those Oklahoma cattle people. If you've got an emergency, you might want my number. Well, speaking of an emergency, um, folks, stay tuned out there. I got a um, Katahdin sheep down the hill, which to me is the best tasting meat on planet Earth. I am going because she is not going to make it. Um, I'm going to do another butchery video on how I do lamb, and I think you're going to dig it. I can't wait to talk to Tiffany again, and I can't wait to follow her career. Until next time, y'all stay alert, stay alive. Thank you, Billy.